Amen. The Lord is so good to us. I'm thankful. Amen. For the goodness, the grace of God. Amen. As you notice there at the entranceway of the church, we have a little table set up. with some things on it uh, from Bolivia. And uh, maybe you can stop by there and look at that if you haven't had a chance. Have a few picture books. But just briefly about the country of Bolivia. Uh, we have about 11 million people that live in the country of Bolivia. And... Um, uh, Spanish is the predominant language, but uh, the government recognizes over 30 different languages as official languages, so makes for a pretty diverse culture. Amen. And um, we have about 40 churches there right now, and our goal is to be able to go back there and start some more churches. I know to some, 40 would seem sufficient, but that's only one church for every, for every 270,000 people. And uh, we want to try to increase the number of churches there and try to train some new ministers to take over those churches. Amen. And uh, see revival and see what God is going to do. Amen. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to do this and to be a part of what God is doing. I've learned over time that the... Um, we all want to be happy in life, don't we? Yes. You, you want to be happy. Yes. You want to do things that make you happy. And I've learned in my life, I've not always been in church, but I've learned in my life that uh, if I'm ever going to be happy, if I'm ever going to have any kind of sense of joy in my life, that the best thing a, a Christian can do is do what God has called them to do. And when we don't do what God has called us to do, we experience frustration and anger and bitterness. And uh, we blame people because we don't ever have that sense of happiness in our lives or that lasting happiness or joy. Amen. And the best thing we can do as Christians is just do what God has called us to do. Yes, and uh, for all of us, that may be uh, something a little bit different. For us, it's going to, to South America, to the country of Bolivia, to work there. And, um, but I've just learned that over time, that the best thing we can do is do what God has called us to do. Amen. And um, we are here trying to find partners, sponsors, to help us to be able to go back there. And um, on our table, we have some forms back there, partners and mission forms. Uh, if you would like to help us and partner with us uh, to help us be able to go back to Bolivia, it would be very uh, appreciative. We would be very appreciative of that. Amen. Because we can't do what we do without churches like yours, without people like you. And uh, the commission is still the same. And Jesus hasn't changed the commission at all. It is that we are to go out and to preach the gospel and to make disciples. And we are to go out into all the world. But the reality is that not all of us are going to be able to go. Amen. And so those uh, that do go, we are supposed to help them in and, and our own personal lives. You know, we help missionaries. We have some, we help missionaries that are in Africa, uh, Asia, Europe, even here in North America. Because we want to see the gospel spread throughout the whole world. Amen. So if there's something you would like to do and help us out, talk to your pastor about it. And then... Uh, we have some of these project forms, the green ones. Uh, this could be a one-time offering. We're trying to raise funds for various projects. Uh, one of those, for example, is for church planting. And uh, those funds help us to be able to buy property, build new buildings. And, uh, you know, on our table out there, we have some, some pens we're selling, some very nice ink pens. And uh, we're selling those for $40 a piece. And I know to some that's going to sound really expensive, $40 for a pen. And uh, it is, it is expensive. But it's not so much as you're buying the pen as it is you're helping us build churches in Bolivia. We don't keep any of the $40. It doesn't go into our pocket. It all goes to our church planting project. And as I said, those funds help us to be able to build buildings, buy new property for the churches there. And... Uh, and another special thing about the pen, it's made out of a wood called Bolivian Rosewood. A very nice pen, so if you'd like to get one of those. And as I said, it's not so much as you're getting the pen as it is you're helping us build new churches. 
And I would like for you to just consider that and help us out with, uh, or if you want the project funds to go to something else, that's fine too. We have several other projects uh, you could help us out with. Uh, also on our table, we have these cards, it has our name and photo on it. And um, grab some of these, that way you can remember to pray for us and pray for the country of Bolivia. And I know that um, uh, I'm asking for money, and, and that's how the world operates, right? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if you, could, if you could go shopping at Walmart and get about $300 worth of things and get to the checkout line, and uh, they would say cash or credit, and you would say, my good looks. I'm yeah. paying for this with my good looks. That would, be, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But that's not how the world works. And um, the world has to have money to operate in. And to go on, uh, to, to work in South America, we have to have money to operate. And um, if you'd like to help us out with that again, that'd be awesome. But even more than money, even more than money, we need your prayers. We need your prayers. So grab a couple of these cards and please pray for us. Uh, because the truth is, there's all kinds of reasons why we can't give money. Budget's tight, maybe you didn't work enough, maybe you're looking for a better job. All kinds of things, unexpected bills pop up. There's all kinds of reasons of why we can't help out financially. Uh, however, there's never an excuse good enough not to pray. That's right. I mean, we think there's plenty of good excuses for not praying, but... But in the eyes of the Lord, there's never an excuse good enough not to pray. So grab some of these cards. That way you can help us and um, help us pray for the country of Bolivia. Amen. We do need your prayers. As my wife mentioned, we go through a lot of things. And I think every, we've made three trips there. And every trip, uh, I think one of us has almost died. <laughs> Amen. And so we need your prayers. Yes. It, would, it would be very helpful. There. Amen. I do want to take a few moments this morning and try to share something with you from the Word of the Lord. And um, I know we are kind of on a, a tight schedule. We have an afternoon service in Flint. And um, so I just want to jump right into this and, and share something with you from the Word of the Lord. I, I enjoyed what your pastor was saying. Amen. That... Um, we have to learn how to see the Lord as triumphant. Amen. Because there's so many things in life that will just push you down, push you down. And, and life has a way of just grinding, grinding you down. Amen. And we have to learn how to see the Lord as being all triumphant. Amen. But just want to just teach a little bit this morning. And I'm not, not going to keep you long. Um, but in John 19, I want to read a few verses here, and uh, just something that's been on my mind this morning as we're trying to get up and get dressed and get ready, and so maybe this will make um, some kind of sense here, but um, if you wouldn't mind standing one more time, John 19, and just reading a handful of verses here. Uh, John 19 and verse 1, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put, him on a, put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priest thereof and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Amen. Uh, again, let's just take a moment and pray, Lord. We thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And some way and somehow I ask you that you would help me uh, direct my mind, my thoughts, the intentions of my heart. I pray that you would help me and anoint me to minister your word to your people this morning. I pray that your spirit would capture our attention and that your spirit would minister freely among us today. And I pray that you would help us as a body of believers to be attentive and to open up our hearts, our minds, our ears, 
that we may receive the word of the Lord with faith and gladness today and that you would challenge us and minister unto us and help us today to draw closer unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. You can be seated. Amen. As has already been mentioned, uh, Easter is coming up next, next Sunday, and uh, it's a very important time uh, in the life of the Christian, talking about the resurrection, reminding ourselves of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But um, in this uh, setting here, John 19, of course, this is the eve Evening, the night of his uh, crucifixion, and as you may well know, he and his disciples, they have their last meal together, and then they go off into the Garden of Gethsemane, and there Jesus is, is praying, and um, the soldiers from the temple come, somewhere in the nighttime, and, and arrest Jesus, and they bring him uh, first to Annas' house, and they question him there, and uh, Annas was the high, was the father-in-law of the high priest, and and so no doubt he was still running the show there in Jerusalem, and so they take him to the father-in-law's house first, and then they take him to Caiaphas's house, and there they question him and slap him around some and spit on him, and and eventually they go and they wake up Pilate, and Pilate was basically the governor there of Jerusalem during this time, and. And they wake up Pilate, and they want Pilate to crucify, to put Jesus uh, to death. And you ever been woke up in the middle of the night, you know, and uh, by some kind of unforeseen circumstance, and you're trying to get your bearings together, and trying to figure out what's going on, and try to get woke up, and, and figure out what's happening? I, I figure Pilate was like that there in the middle of the night, and try to make sense of what was going on. And, and, um, and, and when he learned that Jesus was from Galilee, that was a different jurisdiction. And so Pilate sent Jesus to, to Herod, trying to get out of, of uh, doing what the Jews wanted him to do. And, and uh, Jesus really didn't entertain Herod too much, didn't, at, didn't answer him any questions. And uh, so Herod just sent him back to Pilate. And so... Uh, there Pilate is with Jesus, and, and on a couple of times uh, he would question Jesus and try to talk to him, and eventually somewhere in that course of the night, just taking a few moments and spending that little bit of time with Jesus and, and trying to talk to Jesus, trying to figure out what was going on, and, and w trying to figure out why the Jews and the lawyers, the Pharisees, hated him so much and wanted to put him to death. He's trying to uh, question Jesus and figure out what was going on. And, and uh, eventually, Pilate brings Jesus out on the platform and uh, announces to them, to that crowd that was screaming, crucify him, uh, was that he said, I, I find no fault in him. Yeah. I don't find anything worthy of death in him. I don't find anything in him that we could charge him with anything. I... Find no fault with him. And of course, this was after Jesus had been beaten. Uh, they had mocked him and, and put the crown of thorns on his head. And so you can imagine uh, Jesus being in pain, bloodied, bruised, battered, spit up on. And he's standing there before the crowd. And, and when, when, when Pilate brings him out and he says that he's found no fault in him, of course, it seems like this just makes the people angrier. And they began to scream at him, crucify him, crucify him. And, and Pilate, trying not to put himself in this, trying not to, to be blamed for Jesus' death, it seems. He, he says, you take him and, and you do whatever you want to with him, but I find no fault with him. Uh, we live in an age of time where we're... Uh, it seems like everybody's a skeptic. If you, if you get on the internet or if you get on Facebook or whatever, no doubt you've seen pictures and things happen. And the first thing you'll say is, that's been Photoshopped. Yeah. <laughs> that ain't real. Or you see someone recorded a video of some uh, wild event happening or something taking place or whatever. And the first thing you say is, Man, how do they make that video? That ain't real. That can't be real. 
And we live in an age where, where it kind of breeds skepticism and faithlessness. And um, live in an age of there's an increase, especially here in North America, an increase of, of atheism, people that don't believe in God. And um, so it is today. There, there will always be people in the world that will want to put Jesus to death again, to kill him. Don't want him in his, they don't want him in their life. They don't want anything to do with him. And they, the proverbial, let's crucify him again. Let's put him to death. There's an interesting passage in, in the Old Testament in Psalm 18 where uh, David is writing. And, and uh, he says in Psalm 18 in verse number 25, he says, With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, or with the wicked, thou wilt show thyself froward or wicked. And our relationship with God really depends on how we view God. Because there will always be some that will want to crucify Him and and I'm, I'm just speaking from personal experience. And I know that my life has, always, has not always gone the way that I wanted it to go. And it's not always taken the right turns or the turns I thought that it should take. But when I examine my relationship with the Lord, I really can't find any fault in Him. No. I really can't find any fault in Him. And uh, the Lord will respond to us the way we see Him or the way we view Him if we are merciful and, uh, and if we see Him as being merciful. He will show Himself to us as merciful. And if we see Him as pure, He will show Himself as being pure. And if we think of the Lord as being wicked, He will show Himself as being wicked, or if we feel that God is unjust, uh, and then He will show Himself as unjust. It's, and if we, you know, it's kind of like the atheist. To the atheist, He will show Himself absent and uninvolved. How we look at God will determine our interaction with God and how we view Him. There's people... Uh, there's people that they know the Bible better than you do, but yet they don't believe in God because at some point in their life when they read the Bible, all they could focus on was the areas where it seemed like God was overbearing and harsh and a God of rules and a God of standards. And, a, and it, it, He would come across as being mean and mean-spirited. And it just seemed like God always wanted to punish people and, and destroy people's lives. And so now they don't want anything to do with God because when they think of the Bible, that's the only way they can think of God. Yeah. But it's so interesting, when others see the Bible and read the Bible, all they can see is a loving Savior who gave Himself for us so that we could escape from the pangs of sin and of death. And it's all how we view Him. Yes, sir. I remember many years ago in the little town that we lived in back in Texas, my wife, she was trying to help out. It was an, it was an elderly lady, and she'd go and pick her up, the, to, uh, pick her up and bring her to church. And... and um, the woman, it was just one of those people who could never find anything positive to say. Right? I, if someone gave her a, a million dollars, she would complain that it wasn't all in 20s. <laughs> right? I mean, she could never find anything positive to say. And, and eventually, whenever you have that kind of attitude, I don't... I don't care how often you pray. I don't care how often you read your Bible. Eventually that same critical spirit will bleed over into how you view God. Yeah. And it will begin to distort how you view the Lord. Amen. And I, again, I'm just speaking of myself this morning. Maybe you can find fault with what God has done in your life. And I, I suppose we all can find things that didn't happen the way we wanted them to. But I, I'm just speaking of myself. I'm kind of like Pilate this morning. I find no fault 
in Him. Yes, sir. He's still perfect. He's still pure. He is. He's still holy. As Paul said, He's the only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that dwells in a light that no one can approach. James said of Him that there was no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He's still the same as He was yesterday, and He's the same today, and He will be the same tomorrow. Yes. See, to the faithful, He will show Himself faithful. To the kind, He will show Himself kind. To the generous, He will show Himself generous. As, Paul, as Peter was writing in his first letter to the early church in 1 Peter chapter 2, he begins to write. And he says in verse number 4, To whom coming as unto a living stone... Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house as holy and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, he that believeth on him shall not be confounded or confused. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. It, it's interesting that the apostle Peter, in his two letters to the early church, he used the word precious more than any other New Testament writer. Precious. We just used it three times in these handful of verses. Another time in the first chapter, he talks about the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But notice what he says here in verse number 7. He says, Unto you therefore which believe, He is precious. And I'm looking at you this morning, and I assume that you're here because at some level, uh, somewhere is in your heart, your mind, at some level you believe. You believe the Bible, you believe in Jesus Christ, uh, you believe in redemption, you believe in uh, the new birth experience. Uh, I mean, at some level you are here, right, because you believe. Yeah. You believe. And, the, and Peter says, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. I know I'm, I'm probably adding a pause there. Maybe if I could, I could add a comma there. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. See, to those that don't believe, he's not precious. To those that are always finding fault with him, they don't have a problem screaming crucify him. But to those that truly believe, He is precious. And so I, I've come to ask you this morning, and maybe we could uh, do a little bit of self-examination, that if we believe, and I assume that you still believe at some level, that's why you're here this morning, but if we are believers, if we still believe, is He still precious to us? Is He still precious to me? Is He still the most important thing in my life, in your life? Thinking about the life of Moses in, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says this in Hebrews 11 and 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And, and so here we're reading about the life of Moses, and he grew up in a very privileged household, a very privileged life. He was a member of a household that was the most powerful and most wealthy at that time in the world, especially in the Middle Eastern part of the world. 
and, uh, and he could have grown up to be, no doubt, the Pharaoh over all of Egypt. But when he saw what Egypt had to offer in comparison of what Christ had to offer, he felt that Christ was more precious than all the wealth and all the power and all the prestige and the popularity that Egypt had to offer. And so he chose to leave Egypt behind to get a hold of what Christ had to offer. And I assume that you're here this morning because at some point in time in your life, you started on a journey where Christ was more important. Christ was more important than drugs. He was more important than alcohol. He was more important than prestige. He was more important than uh, so many other things in your life. He was more important than, uh, than the fact that your family disagreed with uh, the church that you started going to. And, but He was more precious than all of those things to you at one time. But if we really truly believe still, is He still more precious than all of that. Both Matthew and Mark, as they are talking about Mary, when, when Mary comes and she breaks open that box of ointment, that, that alabaster box of perfume, and, and she anoints it on his, puts it on Jesus' body, as has already been mentioned earlier this morning, to anoint him for his burial. And uh, both of the writers, both Matthew and Mark, they describe the ointment as. Precious. Think about it. That, that, that little box of perfume, uh, scholars say that it, it was the, the price of one year's salary. Think about that. Think about working for an entire year, whatever you make at your job, working for an entire year and saving up all of your money just so you can buy, buy a bottle of perfume. <laughs> I don't know if that's what Mary did. I, maybe it was a family heirloom. Maybe it was something our, her husband had gotten for her. I don't know how she had come in contact with it, but when she came in contact with Jesus, she finally found something that she held that was more precious than the perfume. And she was, at one time, that was the most precious thing in her life. But when Jesus came along, she found something more worthy, more precious than the perfume. And so she chose to break that and shed that upon Him because of what He had done for her. I'm just trying to get you to think a little bit this morning. In our life, if we're to make a list of the most important things in our lives this morning, where would our relationship with God rank? Yeah. If we say, well, he would be at the number one spot, that would be wonderful if that was true. But I have to ask, and I'm asking myself, I'm asking you this morning, if Jesus really is the most important thing in our lives, do we pray like he's the most important thing in our lives? If we feel, really feel like the word of the Lord is so important and so precious to us, do we spend time with it as if it is the most important book in our lives? If, we, if He really is precious to me and to you, then why does prayer become such a drudgery sometimes? Why is it so difficult to read more than one chapter of the Bible a day? We have it so easy here in America, don't we? Yeah. As far as religious freedoms. I know we all can have something we can complain about. We have social eco issues and economic issues and political issues we could talk about this morning. Uh, but I'm just talking about religious issues. How many of you were threatened with your life on the way to church this morning? Nobody. Nobody. As some of you may know, what's been going on in the Middle East and uh, what they call the extremic, extremist Islamic group ISIS is going through and they are killing Christians and people that don't believe with them. And 
Uh, I remember watching some videos, not videos, but looking at some pictures the other day of uh, seeing where they had crucified and where they would behead the Christians. All because they just believe in this book. All because they choose to hold Jesus as precious. And they didn't want to denounce their faith. And I doubt any of us this morning face that kind of oppression or face that kind of threat on the way to church this morning. I remember many years ago there in the country of Bolivia, we were having our general conference. And uh, I wasn't in the country that year, but... Uh, we had a lot of uh, political riots that broke out, and they blocked off all the major roads. And so a lot of the brethren, uh, as they were traveling, they got stranded because uh, of the barricades. And uh, several of them, many of them, had to walk. They had to finish walking to the city where they were having the conference at. And some of those walked for four days just to get to the conference. And, and, and what was so bad about it was they just showed up enough time to catch the very last service. See, it was actually closer for them to turn around and walk back home. Yeah. But see, to some of them, they felt that Jesus was so precious that they didn't have a problem walking four days just to have the chance to be in one service. Huh. And for us, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I live and that I've grown up in the United States. I'm, I'm thankful. Is it, is it perfect? No, it's far from perfect. But I've never been threatened about going to church. And you would think that in a society with so much religious freedom, that we would not have a, time, we would not have a hard time getting to church. We wouldn't have such a hard time praying or spending time with His Word. And it's not that there's anything wrong with the Lord. It's not that the Word of God has changed, but it's that somewhere in the course of our life, we stop viewing Him as precious. Yes, sir. We stop viewing Him as the most important thing in our life. We stop viewing the Word of God as a necessity. And somewhere in the course of that process, we just begin to drift away. If you were like me when you first started coming to church, I don't know anything about any of you. I, I was 21 when I started coming to church. I was involved in all kinds of bad stuff, was not a good person. But I remember how excited I was about my newfound walk with God. I mean, you couldn't keep me out of church. Yeah. I, I want, I mean, to me, it was a delight to pray. I was excited about reading the Bible. Yeah. But if we don't work at maintaining that, it begins to slip and the enthusiasm begins to wane. And we no longer see Him or hold Him as precious. Let's stand this morning. You know, if I, if I thought the Lord was so precious, I would invite other people to church. It's kind of like uh, if you're going shopping and you find a good deal on something. I mean, a deal that's almost unbelievable, right, brother? Yeah. I mean, it, normally you're going to call somebody. I mean, I know my wife would. <laughs> She's out shopping, you find a great deal on something. Five pairs of shoes for $20, brand new. Your size and your color. You would be excited. Right? <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. 
But if I get more excited about shopping than I do my relationship with Jesus, something is out of line. So the first question again is, do I still believe? Do you still believe? I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, would say, yes, we still believe. And then my question is, is He still precious? Is He still the most important thing in your life? If not, why not? If not, what has come in between you and Him? Between me and Him? Where did I begin to lose my way? Where... where where did your enthusiasm begin to die out? Amen. Could we just take a moment and lift our hands? And I, I know it's, it's a simple message. I, I'm not screaming and yelling too much. But if we could just take a moment... We're about to leave. We're about to go and eat and do, do all kinds of stuff here in just a moment. But could we just take a moment and, and just examine ourselves, examine the heart, our heart, and is He still precious? Do I still love Him the way I first loved Him? Do I still honor His Word the, the way I first honored His Word? Do I still get excited when it's time for church? Do I still look forward to my prayer time and my study time? It would definitely be a strange thing for someone to serve a God who they don't find precious or valuable. As your pastor comes, let's, let's for just a few moments, let's just talk to the Lord and let's just, just reflect upon our personal lives this morning. And let's just talk to the Lord for just a moment.